Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and last week I read the account of Union General John Gibbon about the Council of War held by Army of the Potomac Commander George Meade, during which they discussed the plans for July 3rd, which would end up being the defense against Pickett's Charge. In this video, I will read John Gibbon's amazing account of Pickett's Charge, which his division took a main role in throwing back. Almost instantly afterwards, the whole air above and around us was filled with bursting and screaming projectiles and the continuous thunder of the guns, telling us that something serious was at hand. All jumped to their feet and loud calls were made for horses, which orderlies hurried forward with, already saddled and waiting. Mine did not come at once. The reason, as I afterwards learned, was that a shell struck my faithful orderly, killing him instantly. Anxious to get upon my line, I started on a run up a little swell leading directly up to the center of it. Some features of that hurried trip are indelibly impressed upon my memory. The thunder of the guns was incessant, for all of ours had now opened and the whole air seemed filled with rushing, screaming, and bursting shells. The larger round shells could be seen plainly as in their nearly completed course they curved in their fall towards the Tawny Town Road. But the long rifled shells came with a rush and a scream and could only be seen in their rapid flight when they upset and went tumbling through the air, creating the uncomfortable impression that, no matter whether you were in front of the gun from which they came or not, you were liable to be hit. Every moment or so one would burst, throwing its fragments about in a most disagreeable promiscuous manner, or first striking the ground, plow a great furrow in the earth and rocks, throwing these last about in a way quite as dangerous as the pieces of the exploding shell. At last I reached the brow of the hill to find myself in the most infernal pandemonium it has ever been my fortune to look upon. Very few troops were in sight, and those that were, were hugging the ground closely, some behind the stone wall, some not, but the artillerymen were all busily at work at their guns, thundering out defiance to the enemy whose shells were bursting in and around them at a fearful rate, striking now a horse, now a limber, and now a man. Over all hung a heavy pall of smoke, underneath which could be seen the rapidly moving legs of the men as they rushed to and fro between the pieces and the line of limbers, carrying forward the ammunition. One thing which forcibly occurred to me was the perfect quiet with which the horses stood in their places, even when a shell striking in the midst of a team would knock over one or two of them, or hurl one struggling in his death agonies to the ground, the rest would make no effort to struggle or escape, but would stand stolidly by as if saying to themselves it is fate, it is useless to try to avoid it. Looking thus at Cushing's battery, my eyes happened to rest upon one of the gunners standing in rear of the nearest limber, the lid open showing the charges. Suddenly, with a shriek, came a shell right underneath the limber box, and the poor gunner went hopping to the rear on one leg, the shreds of the other dangling about as he went. As I reached the line just to the left of Cushing's battery, I found General Webb seated on the ground as coolly as though he had no interest in the scene, and somehow it seemed to me that in such a place men appear to take things a good deal as I remarked the horses took them. Of course, it would be absurd to say that we were not scared. How is it possible for a sentient being to be in such a place and not experience a sense of alarm? None but fools, I think, can deny that they are afraid in battle. What does this mean? I asked. Webb shook his head. In fact, it was a question about which we all felt anxious, but no one could answer it yet. It might mean a preparation for retreat. It might signify the prelude to an assault. How long did this pandemonium last? Measured by our feelings, it might have been an age. In point of fact, it may have been an hour or three or five. The measurement of time under such circumstances, regular as it may be by the watch, is exceedingly uncertain by the watchers. Getting tired of seeing men and horses torn to pieces and observing that although some of the shells struck and burst among us, most of them went high and burst behind us. The idea occurred to me that a position farther to the front would be safer, and rising to my feet, I walked forward accompanied by my aide, Lieutenant Haskell. I had made but a few steps when three of Cushing's limber boxes blew up at once, sending the contents in a vast column of dense smoke high in the air, and above the din could be heard the triumphant yells of the enemy as he recognized the result of his fire. Passing the clump of trees referred to as marking this point of our line, we walked forward to the fence, where the men were lying close behind it and motioning them to make room for me. I stepped over the wall, went to a little clump of bushes standing just in front of the line, 
and looked out there to see if I could detect any movement going on in that direction. Nothing could be seen but the smoke constantly issuing from the long line of batteries and nothing heard but the continuous roar of hundreds of guns, the scream of countless projectiles as they rushed through the air in all directions and the bursting of shells. These all went over our heads and generally burst behind us. While standing here and wondering how all this din would terminate, Mitchell, an aide of General Hancock, joined me with a message from Hancock to know what I thought the meaning of this terrific fire. I replied I thought it was the prelude either to a retreat or an assault. After standing here for some time and finding the enemy did not lessen the elevation of his pieces, we walked down to the left, still outside of the line of battle, the men peering at us curiously from behind the stone wall as we passed along. As we approached the left of my division, the line made a slight inclination to the front, beyond which was the spring alluded to in the description of the ground. As we neared the piece of marshy ground below it, I called Lieutenant Haskell's attention to a man who had evidently left his regiment in front to get some water. Around his neck were hung several canteens, and he was crawling back through the wet ground, keeping as close to the earth as possible, evidently fearful of the shot and shell soaring over his head. As we came nearer, I called out to him, Look out, my man, you might get hit. At the sound of my voice, he turned his head, still keeping as close to the ground as possible, to look at me and then, as if inspired by a new idea, rose to his feet and walked deliberately back to his regiment, no doubt arguing with himself that if two men could walk erect, there was little danger to a third. Passing around to the left of my line, I was proceeding behind it up towards the right when I noticed a man coming across the field carrying another, evidently wounded on his back. Just as they came opposite to us, they encountered a low stone wall over which one was trying to climb with the other still on his back. I stopped and told Haskell to assist them, and we then continued on our way. The fire on both sides had now considerably slackened, and only a few shells were coming from the enemy's guns. As we walked towards the right, a staff officer with an orderly leading my horse met me with the information that the enemy was coming in force. I hurriedly mounted and rode to the top of the hill where a magnificent sight met my eyes. The enemy in a long gray line was marching towards us over the rolling ground in our front, their flags fluttering in the air and serving as guides to their line of battle. In front was a heavy skirmish line which was driving ours in on a run. Behind the front line another appeared, and finally a third, and the whole came on like great waves of men, steadily and stolidly. Hastily telling Haskell to ride to General Meade and tell him the enemy was coming upon us in force and we should need all the help he could send us, I directed the guns of Arnold's battery to be run forward to the wall loaded with double rounds of canister, and then rode down my line and cautioned the men not to fire until the first line crossed the Emmitsburg Road. By this time the bullets were flying pretty thickly along the line and the batteries from other portions of the field had opened fire upon the moving mass in front of us. The front line reached the Emmitsburg Road and hastily springing over the two fences, paused a moment to reform and then started up the slope. My division up to this time had fired but little but now, from the low stone wall on each side of the angle, every gun along it sent forth the most terrific fire. From my position on the left, I could see the terrible effect of this. The mounted officers in the rear were seen to go down before it, and as the rear lines came up and clambered over the fences, men fell from the top rails, but the mass still moved on up to our very guns in the stone wall in front. I noticed after all three lines were closed up that the men on the right of the assaulting force were continually closing in to their left, evidently to fill gaps made by our fire, and that the right of their line was hesitating behind the clump of bushes where I had stood during the cannonade. To our left of this point was a regiment of the division, and desirous of aiding in the desperate struggle now taking place on the hill to the right, I endeavored to get this regiment to swing out to the front by a change front forward on the right company, take the enemy's line in flank to sweep up along the front of our line. But in the noise and turmoil of the conflict, it was difficult to give my orders understood. Few unacquainted with the rigid requirements of discipline and of how an efficient military organization must necessarily be a machine which works at the will of one man, as completely as a locomotive obeys the will of the engineer, not in all things, but in everything which the locomotive was built to obey, can appreciate the importance of drill and discipline in a crisis like the one now facing us. In my eagerness to get the regiment to swing out and do what I wanted, I spurred my horse in front of it and weighed forward the left flank. I was suddenly recalled to the absurd position I had assumed 
of the whole regiment opening fire, I got to the rear as soon as possible, looking to my left to see if I could find troops there likely to be induced to follow out my orders. I saw a command lying behind a small breastwork I had myself caused to be erected the day before, and putting spurs to my horse, I rode towards it. Just before I reached the position, to my amazement, the men commenced to break to the rear, though there was no fire whatever to amount to anything on their front. With some difficulty, I induced the command to return to their breastwork, calling the attention of the officers and men to the large numbers fallen back from the assaulting party, which could be plainly seen and then, satisfied that I could derive no benefit from that command, I galloped back to my own division and again attempted to get the left of that to swing out. While so engaged, I felt a stinging blow apparently behind the left shoulder. I soon began to grow faint from the loss of blood which was trickling from my left hand. I directed my aide to turn over command of the division to General Harrow and in company with another staff officer, Captain Francis Wessels, 106 Pennsylvania, left the field, the sounds of the conflict on the hill still ringing in my ears.